Good morning and welcome to Sharper Iron. Spend the next hour with us studying the living and active Word of God, His two-edged sword of law and gospel, recorded for you in Holy Scripture, all about Jesus Christ, crucified, risen, and ascended for you. Thanks for tuning in this morning here on Worldwide KFUO. Christ for you, anytime, anywhere. I'm your host, Pastor Timothy Apple of Grace Lutheran Church in Smithville, Texas. Sharper Iron is underwritten by the Lutheran Church Extension Fund, where your investments help support the work of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. Visit lcef.org for more information. On this Tuesday, July 21st, we are studying Judges chapter 8, verses 22 through 35. The threat of Midian has been subdued, but the threat of idolatry remains. The account of Gideon's leadership over Israel comes to a less than faithful end, with our text today. To help us sharpen our faith in Christ as we study God's Word today, we have with us regular guest, Pastor Chris Hull. Pastor Hull serves at Zion Lutheran Church in Tomball, Texas. Pastor Hull, welcome back to Sharper Iron. Brother Apple, thank you for having me. It is always fun times being with you. So as we get these fun times started this morning, we're in Judges 8, the end of the chapter. We've seen the majority of Gideon's story up until this end. What do we need to know about Gideon, the book of Judges as a whole, that will help us as we dig into the verses we have today? I mean, Judges is just fun times, right? You have Joshua who ha- has died. He brought it, the children into the promised land. But then you have, like right at the beginning of Judges, the the that generation where they don't remember things. They don't remember what God did for them because it wasn't handed down to them. That catechesis was lacking. So in Judges, you see this constant, they're faithful for a time because God delivered them, then they're unfaithful and they're captive again. And you keep seeing this over and over again throughout the book of Judges. And then you finally have this Gideon guy raised up. And we even sing about Gideon in one of our hymns, hymn 666, O Little Flock, Fear Not the Foe. So Gideon is this triumphant victor. And it's interesting with him. You have he's a very complex character. You have him bartering for leadership, yet when asked to be a leader, he says, No, it's the Lord who's your leader. And yet again shows that no one is righteous, no, not one. Even though he does righteous things, he does what God sends him to do. Gideon can still be that flawed character as well. So it's fun times thus far with him. That's right. And I, I think he as a, he's a complex character. He's certainly a flawed character. His his whole uh, story arc is, I think you see some development within him. He starts off as a pretty timid sort of guy. He's threshing mm-hmm. wheat in a wine press, which is, is laughable that you would even try that. But that's how afraid he is of the Midianites. The right. angel of the Lord shows up, and they have a theological conversation together, a very deep one, perhaps. But you see his, you see his fear initially, his timidity. He he needs lots of signs. He he initially tears his father's altar down at night because he's too afraid to do it in the daylight. The Lord keeps strengthening him, and and that that leads you know to that that famous battle scene, which is no battle at all, really. The Lord simply turns Midian on itself while Gideon and his three hundred men watch. And it yeah. seems that, that that moment, at least for Gideon as a just an outward character, it, it turns him a bit. He he loses that timidity, and he turns a bit more zealous. And we saw a little bit of that yesterday in the first part of chapter 8, where perhaps that zeal starts to go a bit too far in the way mm. that he treats his fellow Israelites, in the way that he exacts, it seems. And it, we don't want to be... We don't want to dig too deeply into things that aren't revealed, but it seems he, he's digging a little bit too deep into personal vengeance and anger rather than leaving those with the Lord. So, I mean, he is a, a very complex character. We're going to see a bit more of that today, and 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 maybe we can reflect on this at the end too. But I think to, to reckon what you said there from Romans 3, that no one is righteous, not one, is where we're going to need to end, end up here, is that mm-hmm. as, as much as we see Gideon as a faithful judge in the sense that he listens to the Lord, he he delivers the people through from the Lord's command, we also still see his sin very clearly. But that's not going to be any different than any sinner. That's how the Lord saves us, is as sinners. He saves sinners. He doesn't save the righteous. He came for sinners. And that's right. who Gideon is. And, and so even as we dig into perhaps more of his flaws and his sins in today's text— we remember him as 
one who was saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. His name gets mentioned in Hebrews chapter 11 with those who were saved by faith. And and even as we kind of you know dig and say, well, where is Gideon coming from on these things? That is the overarching thing that we need to hold on to. Correct. It, when you look at the scriptures, Luther would always bring this back that everything deals with Christ. It's all about Christ. Not that you can open up like Judges 8, 10 and it says now Zeba and Zalmuna were in care. I love these names. This is when you like have a Sunday when you tell the elder, you go ahead and do the reading, you know, <laughs> something like that. Or the person who really wants to be a, a reader, you give them this, like, never mind, Pastor, you go ahead and keep reading. Um, but reading that, you're like, what's that have to do with Jesus? It's seeing though that Christ is it all flows from Christ and to Christ, his salvation for all of humanity all mankind and everything is according to god's plan that's why i love habakkuk so much i actually got that i know it sounds silly a missouri senate pastor saying he got this but i got it from listening to a billy graham sermon Mm -hmm. one time when billy graham makes the point when habakkuk asks god what are you up to and he god answers i wouldn't i can't tell you because you wouldn't even believe it Mm -hmm. so when you look at this unfolding of history it's god at work to save man We wouldn't believe that's what he's up to, but that is what he's up to the entire time, Mm -hmm. is that man be saved and dwell forever with him. Right, yeah, and and keeping that as a focus then I think helps us when we get to accounts like this. There's multiple ones, as you said, in the book of Judges, where we're like, what— What's that doing in the Bible? But but that's yeah. that's the point, right? Is that this is God working out in history his salvation for sinners in Christ Jesus. And this is a part of it. And it's it's messy, it's ugly, but that's who Jesus came to save. He came to save right. sinners. And and if we leave out accounts like this, you know, I don't think I, I don't know if, if you teach this in Zion Sunday school in Tomball. I don't think we teach it in Grace's Sunday School mm. in Smithville. But if we never pay attention to to accounts like this we we lose that that element that yeah. the lord is saving real sinners not imaginary ones but real sinners yeah. well it's like you get to genesis 38 you skip over it. we don't want to talk about judah and tamar this is bad history right here. No, you talk about it. You talk about Onan. You talk about these things because that's who Christ came to save. And if it wasn't for Tamar doing what she did, I mean, that's the, there's a reason Matthew puts that right in your face in the genealogy. It's like, boom, this is where the Savior came from, are real sinners, because he came to save real sinners. And that's he came to, like Luther said, against Erasmus and bondage of the will— Christ came into the sewer to rescue the depths of our depravity. So it's fun stuff. Right, right. So so here we're going to see Gideon. I don't know how far he gets into that sewer. We're, we'll, we'll maybe talk about that. But we're going <clears> to <throat> see Gideon as a sinner today. And that's okay, because Christ came to save sinners like Gideon. So let's see what happens. Judges 8, beginning at verse 22. Then the men of Israel said to Gideon, Rule over us, you and your son and your grandson also, for you have saved us from the hand of Midian. Gideon said to them, I will not rule over you, and my son will not rule over you. The Lord will rule over you. And Gideon said to them, Let me make a request of you. Every one of you, give me the earrings from his spoil. For they had golden earrings, because they were Ishmaelites. And they answered, We will give. We will willingly give them. And they spread a cloak, and every man threw in it the earrings of his spoil. And the weight of the golden earrings that he requested was 1,700 shekels of gold, besides the crescent ornaments and the pendants and the purple garments worn by the kings of Midian, and besides the collars that were around the necks of their camels. And Gideon made an ephod of it and put it in his city in Aphra. Then and all Israel whored after it there, and it became a snare to Gideon and to his family. So Midian was subdued before the people of Israel, and they raised their heads no more, and the land had rest 40 years in the days of Gideon. All right, we'll pause there. So this is, mm. again, Gideon has, he's defeated Midian at this point. The two princes of, I mean, those those fun names, Oreb and Zeb, yeah. the two princes of Midian have been killed. The two kings of Midian, Zeba and Zalman, they've been killed. So there's, there's peace. And the first part of this text is this interaction between the men of Israel and Gideon. It sounds like, the Israelites want Gideon to be a more permanent ruler than any 
judge we've seen so far in the land of Israel, and, and not only Gideon himself, but a family line, a dynasty of sorts, Gideon refuses. So let, I mean, let's, let's explore that interaction a bit. What, what's going on in the minds of the people of Israel, and then why does Gideon respond the way he does? Well, I first love with Israel is you hear that psalm, trust not in princes, for they they will fail you. They are but mortal as we sing in our hymn. I love right now, like if you go on Facebook, it, there's this meme that shows President Trump, 2020, 2024, it has his daughter, and then uh, her again, 2028. So it's like, if we keep it with this, we'll be fine. We'll be great. If we could just have the guy or gal we want leading us, everything will be fine. We are the exact same as the Israelites. We put all of our faith in a man of flesh and blood who is mortal, who fails. We put our trust in him and we despair. I remember the night when um, when Hillary was defeated. You saw some of these people who voted for her just mourning and crying and weeping. And you see this, this reality of our trust. Either we're, we're really angry or really happy by who our governing official is, and we make them into a god, into a, a – like maybe not a full god because we still go to church Sunday. We make them into like a demigod, this lesser god that will help us in life instead of seeing them as the mere instrument of God, the one God uses like we confess in the fourth commandment. And you see this with the Israelites. They want Gideon because he's done so much for them. Well, if we keep him around and we're sure that his son will be the same way, if we let that keep going, then everything will be okay for us. Instead of trusting in God to take care of them, they trust in a man to do it. Mm-hmm. Well, At what, least with Israel here. Sure. And what I mean, what is it about our, our leaders? Because I think you're right in identifying this being a, a sin that— people fall into, not just in Judges chapter 8, but throughout history. What is it about earthly leaders that makes them such a tempting idol? Well, one, we can see them. We create them. Uh, that's why we have a problem with God. We can't see him. We, we can't touch him, feel him, smell him, all these things. And with a man— it's someone that we can even relate to to a point. He's had the same struggles I've had, and look at the leadership he has. Look at how he's pulled himself up, what he's been able to accomplish, and he's going to do that for me. And it's an immediate um, – re- not response isn't the word. We get something out of it immediately, hmm. Hmm. or at least we think we do. And the problem is man is always – always done this uh look at what man tried doing with jesus in john 6. Mm. jesus fled lest they make him a king make him into something he's not meant to be and that's what we do with these mortals these these men these women and we think they're going to solve the problems even take something like roe versus wade we keep praying maybe one day we'll elect enough good people and good judges to reverse it well, it doesn't mean abortion's going to go away. It doesn't mean people are going to love life more. The reality is man must be put to death and brought back to life in Christ. Law and gospel must be preached. God must be the one that changes the heart. Man cannot do it. And we like trusting in that because that's our immediate nature because of the fall. <laughs> we, we trust the lie. What is it in Romans 1? They exchange the truth of God for the lie. And the lie has convinced us that man can solve all of the problems. Right. I, I'm, and they go, I think I think what, what happens here is that they're going beyond what God had given them in Gideon. I mean, we'll, yeah. we'll, we'll get this later in the text, that Gideon does do a lot of good for the people of Israel, and they fail to remember that by the end of the text. So we're not denying that Gideon was a, a good leader, a godly leader, again, with his sins, which we'll, we'll talk about. But in this request, the people of Israel are going beyond what God had given them in Gideon. They hadn't received in Gideon one to set up some sort of dynasty in his family. They'd received a deliverer from the hand of Midian, from idolatry in Midian, 
and now they're going beyond that for some sort of security outside of the Lord and his word. Because that's that's how why Gideon was good, was because the Lord had given Gideon to them according to his word. They're going right. beyond that. Now, it, it seems, at least, that in Gideon's response, well, I mean, he sounds pretty faithful, pretty pious in his response, and it sounds like he's directing them the right way. He says, I'm not going to rule over you. The Lord, he's your... He's your real king. Is, I mean, is this a faithful response? If we're putting the best construction on it, it is. When we put the best construction, and that's what I love when reading Scripture, is the Eighth Commandment still applies to everybody in Scripture, and to everybody still today. So when we look at it, it's like, yeah, the Lord rules over you. This uh, theocracy, which you see prevalent through from Exodus all the way up, at least until the time of the kings. You see it more of a theocracy. Uh, theocracy meaning God is the one who's governing us, and everything we do, we get from God. That's how Moses led, that's how Joshua led, and that's how we see some of the judges leading. And then finally you get to Samuel, and you see the prophet kind of leading that way. Um, at least when I hear it, that verse by itself, this is a pious thing to say. Hmm. But the thing is, it's not like Gideon doesn't get something out of them. I mean, he gets 1,700 shekels of gold, which I, I can't remember how many pounds of gold. That comes out to like 50 to 70 pounds of gold. I mean, he's not getting nothing out of uh, being the leader. <laughs> so I don't know. At least to me, it's like he, he it's pies. But at the same time, I wonder if it's coming out of a place where fearing God, what is God going to do to me? If I say, yeah, of course I'll rule over you. Hmm. Um, at least that's my initial response with it. Sure, and I think I think as the you know, like you said, when you just have those words of Gideon all by themselves, it sounds pretty pious. It sounds pretty faithful, and there's definitely an element of of truth to that. Well, of course, the Lord rules over us, right? This is, I mean, every Christian should confess this that that I, uh, how does it go in the second article of the creed, that I may be his own and live under him in his kingdom, right? Jesus Christ right. reigns as king. He is the one who ultimately rules over me. And so it is, it is pious by itself. But then when yeah. you put it into the context of everything else that happens to Gideon, you, you kind of hmm. wonder if maybe there's not something else going on in the back of his his mind. And and before we get there, though, Pastor Hall, I guess my, my question, with as pious as it sounds, I will not rule over you, my son will not rule over you, the Lord will rule over you. Well, practically speaking— how does how does that actually work out? And I think that's that's maybe what's missing a little bit because you you brought up, for example, Moses and Joshua being mm-hmm. leaders of God's people, yet the Lord as king, or or to think about maybe in, in some modern terms, right? Who who is in charge? I, I ask this question to my confirmand sometimes. Who's in charge of the church, the pastor or the congregation? And the answer mm. is, well, God is. <laughs> Neither, yeah. right? Neither. Christ is the head it's of his Jesus. church, right? Yeah. But at the same time, the fact that Christ is the head of the church does not change the fact that God provides pastors for his church, and they right. they lead in, in a certain sense of that word. So, I mean, I guess, I don't mean to, to sound too American in this sense, but practically mm. speaking— what does that actually look like for the Lord to rule over his people in the most pious sense of the way that we can take Gideon's words? I remember when uh, this was at our district convention, which was what, was it last summer or the summer? I think it was last summer. Do you remember when our district, was it last summer or the summer before Let's that was see. our district? Department? I think 2018. I think you're right. Yeah, 2018, because yeah. we'll have another one next year. Next summer is our convention, I believe. I think you're right. So with, I remember there was a big debate about who has the final authority in our Senate. Is it the district president or the synodical president? Can a pastor who didn't get his uh, w- way, per se, with an accusation go around the district president and go straight to the synodical president? And I went up to the microphone and I said, the reality is none of you are in charge. The scriptures and the confessions are in charge, and the man who rightly upholds that. And in the life of the congregation, those are the guiding principles. So with someone like Gideon, what is the guiding principle for him? Are the words that have been handed down to him. Sasa makes this point a lot in his um, 
his uh, writings on the apostolic succession. It's not which bishop ordained me. It's the word of God that's handed down. So at least in the life of the church today, yeah, it is God who's in charge. And how has God revealed his will is in Holy Scripture. And when your pastor faithfully preaches that, he is in charge. Um, when he corrects you according to Scripture, when he preaches according to Scripture, when you act according to it. That's why your pastor does talk at a voters meeting when you're talking about money. If you say we want to put $2 million into this building fund, well, what are you going to do with the building? Oh, we're going to do this. Well, that has nothing to do with the gospel whatsoever. Well, it's our money. No, it's not. It's God. He's given it to you for his work. And um, leadership takes humility to stand aside and say, I'm handing this over to you. Hmm. Now, Gideon somewhat has that. It's the Lord who rules over you. But I'm wondering with him as we read on. Um He's doing that so he can get this other thing out of them. Well, Gideon's not really asking for much. He's just asking for this. Hmm. Um, I don't know if that answers your question. Well, I think, I think really. it, well, I think it helps, though, because so the Lord will rule over you. Well, the question I, I think or the question I was trying to ask was, how does that work? And the, the way you pointed us was he rules according to his word. It's it's not some it's not an immediate ruling in the sense that he does it without means. He does it through right. the means of his word, which he places into the mouth of his servants. And and today, I mean, you know, he he puts the that word into the mouth of his servants, the pastors, to lead congregations, and that is the Lord ruling. And and the flip side of it too, you know, when when the pastor goes off the rails and speaks unfaithfully, that word belongs to the whole church to lead the pastor back to repentance. Right. So, but it is through those means, the means of the word spoken by his people. So, if Gideon is going to say this in a in a truly pious way for the Lord to rule over you, right now in this context would for, be for him to continue his judgeship, I guess if we can say it that way, over these people according to what the Lord has given him in his word. In other words, right. when he says the Lord will rule over you, the, the pious way to understand that is not to have, that doesn't mean there's no human person that is speaking God's word. Rather, it is the word coming to the people through Gideon, in this case, to be that leader, to lead the people according to the word. So there's there's the means involved. And I, I think, it's so hopefully that, I think that puts, puts us both hopefully on the same page and gives us a bit of a handle as to why we would, why both of us, it seems, are having a bit of trouble understanding Gideon's words here in that best construction and seeing uh, maybe there's not a completely pious thought behind this, the Lord will rule over you. It does seem, based on his actions, and you can take us into this, Pastor Hall, that maybe Gideon's yeah, he's he's out for himself a little bit here, it seems. Well, yeah, because he what does he do immediately? He sees the Ishmaelites. They wear the earrings. Some say they wear these earrings to separate themselves from the Israelites. It's that uh, visible means of saying, okay, there's an Ishmaelite, the descendants of Ishmael, um, and then there's the 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 the, the Israelites, um, and they take all their earrings and everything, and it amounts to this massive amount of gold. And what does he do with it? He makes a an ephod that liturgical type um, garment that God approved, that upper garment of linen for the priest to wear. But it, it says he put it in his city, so it's almost like it has a statue quality um, to it, it seems. It, it's this thing not to be worn for its purpose, but to be used as a display. Because the words there, it says the Israelites hoard after it, and that's that same language, how they would go after Baal and after false gods. So they're not coming to see the ephah used in its right way, the right reason, but they're worshiping the thing itself. And I always love this. Um, I, I'm a big, I mean, I'm, I'm a liturgical, whatever all the uh, adjectives are to describe me, confessional, faithful, liturgical, whatever they are. We can make these things into an idol, mm. the the chasuble, the the stole, the albs, the liturgy itself, the pastor himself. I mean, how many times have we ignored false doctrine from a man because we like him, because we think he's great, and at the same time judged harshly a man we don't like, even though he preaches a beautiful sermon? I don't know how many times I've had to repent 
after walking into a place thinking this guy's a terrible theologian, this is going to be a terrible sermon, he preaches a great one, I have to swallow my words and repent. And with Gideon, we see here this golden ephod that people come and bow down to. They're, they're, it's not being used for the reasons God has given it. And that's where you start seeing, well, maybe Gideon's thing wasn't that pious. Look at what Gideon created with our riches. He didn't go and buy wine and food. But then we see he had a handful of women, as we see in the verses that come after this. <laughs> so it's not like he was living a pauper's life either. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. I mean, again, I, I think the way to, to look at this is where does Gideon go beyond what God has given to him? And, and that's where he, he goes off. So just, I mean, as an example, the, the matter of these earrings, this gold, this spoil. So they took the spoil from, from the captives. And I mean, does Gideon have a, a right to have a portion of that? I suppose so. I mean, at least, if nothing else, right, the worker is worth his wages. So you uh-huh. you support your leader, and this this is not wrong, but Gideon goes beyond that. And and that's where, and again, you know, the, the text isn't perfectly clear in revealing this to us, but the general thrust of it does seem to point in that direction, particularly as we get to that ephod, that Gideon and those who are following him are are not actually letting the Lord rule over them in much of this. And and we'll pick more of that conversation up on the other side of the break. You're listening to Sharper Iron here on KFUO. Going to take a short break, but we'll be right back. Please stick around. Since 1978, Lutheran Church Extension Fund has had the humble privilege of supporting Lutheran Church Missouri Synod Ministries and her workers. Thanks to faithful investors, LCEF has provided thousands of church workers, congregations, schools, and organizations with the low-cost loans and resources they need to reach more people with the saving name of Christ. To learn more, visit lcef.org or call 800-843-5233, 800-843-5233. Welcome back to Sharper Iron. It is Tuesday, July 21st, and we are studying Judges chapter 8, verses 22 through 35. We've got Pastor Chris Hull with us. He serves at Zion Lutheran Church in Tomball, Texas. Pastor Hull, prior to the break, we, we started talking about this ephod that Gideon makes. And, and there's a mention not only of the gold that he receives, but these other spoil items that he's given— among those are the the crescent ornaments, and and that caught my eye because they're mentioned previously in the text we looked at yesterday with Pastor Hemmer, in in verse twenty one of this chapter that Gideon takes those crescent ornaments, and one of the things we talked about with that is that you see an example like you do in many places in the scriptures, of the Lord making fun of idolatry because these ornaments and this, this I think is true of much of the spoil that they t- that are mentioned here in in this text much of it would have been used in some sort of idol worship and so the lord through his victory over these idol worshipers shows the folly the foolishness of that idol worship by giving that as spoil to his people the irony here is that gideon's got that stuff in his hands. He's got this this gold, mm-hmm. these ornaments that would have been used for idolatry, and he's he's got the opportunity to to show clearly the foolishness of idolatry, that that idols are not real, that there is only one true God. But in the way that it plays out, the exact opposite happens, and it only becomes an idol now within Israel itself, which adds to not only the irony, but the tragedy of the whole situation. Well, yeah, and and that's the thing is he takes the gold and rather than, let's say, melting it down, destroying it, getting rid of it, saying these things are worthless, they do nothing for you. Instead, it's morphed into what they use in their temple worship, what the priest wears. And Luther makes the point that this creates a, a false piety. It's like, well, I'm going to take this and I'm going to make, I'm going to sanctify it. I'm going to make it holy. And God, what is it when when Jesus speaks to Peter? 
what I have made clean, you cannot make unclean. What I make holy, you know, it's not for you to do these things. I am the one that does it. And here Gideon takes it upon himself to make something that is not holy, holy. And this you can even trace back to when is the last time a leader in Israel um, said, take the things out of your ears and let's make something out of it. <laughs> You know, this goes right back to the golden calf. And I love how Aaron responds to Moses. Why put this in the fire and out pop this calf? No, you morphed it, Aaron. You you're the one who created it. Don't act like it just popped out of there. Surprise. You morphed and made this thing. And unless God hands it to us, then we should not make it more than what it is. And I mentioned in our break time in, in discussing that as in the time of COVID shutdown, when people couldn't be in church, I think in Texas, it was like almost a two month time period here. We couldn't be in the sanctuary worshiping in that way we usually do. And when asking people, what do you miss about church? It was more of those false, and not that people have a false piety, but a misplaced piety. It was missing church for reasons that you can miss it and it's fine, but it's not the essence of church. It's not the reality of what we really have. I remember Easter Sunday, we did a drive-in service, and our associate pastor, Pastor Daniels, preached a beautiful Easter sermon when he said, yeah, we can't be inside of the building, but that doesn't mean the church is not here. Here is the word. There is the sacrament. You are the people, the assembly of believers receiving this gift. Why do we want to be in church? Because we need to hear the voice of Jesus. We need to hear his forgiveness, his absolution, his assurance that we are loved. What is holy is what he declares to be holy. And when we misplace it, then we have to reeducate ourselves as to why are we doing what we do? Why do we wear the vestments? Why do we do the divine service? Why do we sing matins? Why do we uh, practice closed communion? Why do we do all these things that we do? We have to understand why we do it, and if you don't, then it's just a misplaced piety. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, you you said earlier that you know, how often do we fall into this kind of thinking that I'll sanctify this by my own use of it, that I'll make it holy. And that's that's where things go wrong, because it is the Word of God that makes things holy. I mean, this is the, the third commandment. What is it that makes the Sabbath day holy? It's right. It's the Word that's heard there, and that's what makes it holy. And when we go beyond that— then now we're trying to make it holy by our own work, and that, that just doesn't work. It's God who makes his name holy in the first petition of the Lord's Prayer, not me. It's already holy, and I ask for his name to be holy in my own life, and that only will happen when I listen to his word, and not when I try to go beyond it in some kind of self-made piety. I mean, just as a as a positive example, you, you, you brought up the golden calf. You, you go yeah. before that— the people of Israel are instructed how to build the mm -hmm. tabernacle. Well, right. where did all of the material for the tabernacle come from? That was the spoil they had from Egypt. But right. there you have the Lord's specific instructions. This is what you are to do with it. This is how it is to be holy. So that, again, what made that holy, it wasn't the material in and of itself or, or the people's <coughs> decision how to use it. What made that tabernacle holy was the Lord's word. And and that's where Gideon goes off the rails here. Go ahead. No, and you're exactly right. And we have to get back to that. What the the word of God is what makes something holy and focusing on that. And I love how you brought that up with the tabernacle, because that there's the difference. This is man creating it. This is God doing it. Here with Gideon, it's Gideon doing it. And that's where the snare is. And that's what we have to be cautious of. But but that's why your pastor spends his time in the word. Um, I wrote an article yesterday called Luther 451, based off Fahrenheit 451, and saying we need to return to our, our sources and digest them so we know them, the scriptures, the confessions, and the hymnal. Mm -hmm. Know why we sing what we sing, why we believe what we believe, what we confess, what the Psalms teach us. Because the further we are away from God's word, the more we believe we're making something holy. As long as we can have, and this is maybe one of my critiques of uh, American Lutheranism, as long as the majority votes it, it must be the will of the Spirit. Well, not necessarily so. It's whatever the Word of God says, not what man thinks is right, but what God declares to be right. 
right? Because how how easily can what man declares to be right, how easily can that happen exactly as it does here with Gideon, that this ephod that he sets up becomes an idol after which all Israel whores, and it's also a snare to Gideon and his family itself. And and yet, I mean, and I, I read through verse 28, it's, it's a bit striking that right after that verse, you still mm. get this grace of God, right? Yeah. Midian was subdued before the people of Israel. Midian didn't raise their heads anymore. The land of Israel had rest for 40 years in the days of Gideon. That, that still for this people that is caught up in idolatry, the Lord still gives them his promised rest. That, that beautiful grace of God in the midst of sin, not excusing the sin, but still seeing how God is faithful to his own promises is, is a wonderful contrast right there. Well, it's like in in Exodus when God says, I will punish those who break the commandments to the third and fourth generation, but I'll show love and compassion and grace to a thousand generations. And I was someone asked me one time, they're like, are you saying that if my my dad's an unbeliever, I'm I'm condemned as an unbeliever, too? And I said, well, no, when you go to Ezekiel, not yeah, Ezekiel 18, it says, you know, I will not put the sins of the father on the son. So what we're seeing in Exodus here is a, magn- a magnifying of God's grace, that his grace trumps the wrath, because that's his very nature is mercy. His very nature is merciful. He knows man messes up. He knows man is weak. He knows man, he knows man is a failure. Yet his grace does not, is not dictated by our failure. His grace is just who he is. <laughs> he is. He is the God of compassion. And what does St. John say? God is love. And you see that here with this 40 years in the days of Gideon, 40 years of grace and peace for them. So the account of Gideon continues just a little bit farther. We've heard about the snare that he falls into with his family concerning idolatry, and we hear a little bit more about his family, which will set up Judges chapter 9 for us. So the the end of Judges 8, beginning at verse 29. Jerubbabel, the son of Joash, went and lived in his own house. Now Gideon had 70 sons, his own offspring, for he had many wives. And his concubine, who was in Shechem, also bore him a son, and he called his name Abimelech. And Gideon, the son of Joash, died in a good old age, and was buried in the tomb of Joash his father, at Ophrah of the Abiezrites. As soon as Gideon died, the people of Israel turned again and whored after the Baals, and made baal Barit their god. And the people of Israel did not remember the Lord their god, who had delivered them from the hand of all their enemies on every side, And they did not show steadfast love to the family of Jerubbabel, that is Gideon, in return for all the good that he had done to Israel. So Uh. that's the end of of Judges 8, the end of the account of Gideon. And again, we see that ambiguous picture of him. On the one hand, Scripture is not silent about his sins, and yet on the other hand, is willing to recognize what the Lord did through Gideon as well. I mean, we see that that sinner saint reality. So Pastor Pastor Hull, take us into these last few verses concerning Gideon. First, the matter of Gideon's family life. It, it sounds a bit dysfunctional. Well, it helps us define also earlier when they say we want to make you king. What does he call his son? Abimelech, mm. which means my, what is it? My father is king. <laughs> Isn't that what it means? My yeah. father is king. Yep. That's what and, the name and- means. You know, so it's just it's just great with that. So like, oh, okay, so we see a little bit of, um, you know, best construction would be, oh, his father, his real father is God. But at the same time, it's like, okay, Gideon is calling himself king. Hmm. Um, so you see a little bit of this downfall with Gideon still. I mean, 70 sons, many wives, concubine. He dies at a good old age and he's buried in the tomb. It's amazing with this and this. Um, is so foreign to us this way. You have Solomon who had a lot of, of wives. You had Abraham even having multiple wives. This is very foreign to our concept. The only time we see a man with multiple wives is when you watch a TLC show about it. Um, what is that show? My wife watches it sometimes. It's like a Mormon guy. Like It's not called Me and My Wives. It's not that much on the nose. I can't remember what it's called. It's like Nine Wives and Counting or something like that. I don't know. But it's interesting with this with Gideon. He has all these descendants, and yet Abimelech 
And I wondered, and I couldn't really figure it out when I did the research for it and read why it emphasizes the concubine. Um, and you know what I mean? It's like you have all these wives, and then the concubine is Abimelech. I mean, did that... Maybe I'm making too much out of that, but I don't know. Well, I, I think I think this is one of those places where you get a detail ahead of time that's important later. So yeah. chapter 9 is going to—chapter 9 is a, a bit of an anomaly within the book of Judges. Abimelech isn't a judge per se, and, and I, I think that Abimelech is actually a part of the— he he's a part of the the part of the cycle where the people are actually on their their downward way. He does not represent a high point, and and we'll, right. we'll see that over the next couple of studies as we get into Judges chapter nine. But I, I think the reason that you get mention of Abimelech, particularly in verse thirty one, is because the author's looking forward to, hey, this guy's coming, and it, it'd be good to know a few things about him ahead of time. The fact that he's a, a he's his mom is a concubine from Shechem, is maybe ringing bells in the reader's ears that uh, something bad is about to happen, to put it mildly. Yeah. And I, I think that's that's the main reason that it's it's mentioned there. I, I don't know. You could disagree, I suppose. No, I think you're right, because then you look at Shechem even, it has that mixture. Right. It's Israelites, Canaanites, everything's kind of mixed in together, and that's what God hates. He's like, no, there is no mixture here. Um, and that's being emphasized with this, it's showing the the downfall of Israel, man continuing that downward spiral. When he's not clinging to the word of God, he is descending into the depravity of the world. Mm. So no, that's good stuff. Well, and I think I think the other thing that that you do start to see here is that as the book of Judges has progressed, things are getting worse. It's not when we talk about the cycle of Judges, it's not just sort of lather, rinse, repeat. But every time, it seems that it gets worse. So I mean, if you go mm-hmm. back to you go back all the way to Judges chapter three to Othniel, who you don't you don't get a whole lot about Othniel, and maybe that's okay because Othniel is is in some sense you know there's no real character flaws that are mentioned about him. But as as you keep going, you know, here comes Ehud, he's left handed. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I mean that's that's well, that that doesn't seem quite right. Something's not quite right. The next major judge is is you've got Deborah and Barak, and Barak is a bit of a coward. Mm-hmm. We've, now we've seen Gideon go from maybe too timid to overly zealous, and and that's true here. And and as the as the account goes on in the book of Judges, we're going to meet Jephthah, who who makes a terrible vow and ends in human sacrifice. Samson, I think we all know pretty well from our Sunday school days, and we know that that his mm-hmm. account is not terribly faithful. So I, I get all of that is to say, here in Judges eight, as the narrative has progressed we're seeing even during Gideon's own lifetime and even within the judge himself how how corrupting sin is and how yeah. how evil a time it really was in Israel that even the the best of the best look at what they're falling into and i think i mean again just to to put that that whole context as we look at the the world today like thing, things really aren't getting better <laughs> they're no, they're no. getting worse and and you see it here in the book of judges and and ultimately, you know, to go back to what we're talking about with the Lord ruling over, the only hope that we have is is Christ and his word. Well, exactly. And uh it it reminds me of that text from Luke where it says, When a demon leaves a man, it goes about and returns back with seven worse than itself, and the last state of that man is worse than the first. And people don't want to hear that. They want to hear it's getting better. I'm getting better, society's getting better, we're all getting better. But the reality of sin is, no, sin continues. It's a, it's an infection. It, it's a corrosion. It, it continues growing and getting worse. And I was talking with a member the other day about it. I say, when you were growing up, and this is in the 60s, you know, 50s and 60s, I said, did you deal with some of these things that the church is dealing with today? Or even take me. I grew up in the late 80s into the 90s. I didn't hear about a lot of these things in church. And now what are we dealing with today? What are our children going to deal with in the church? And the reality is when you look at the scriptures, yes, there's nothing new under the sun. Yes, we know that. It continues to get worse. 
But that should then drive us to cling to Christ more. I think you mentioned it the other day on Facebook. What is this time? Is a time for us to live in repentance? Mm. Wasn't it you that wrote that? I, I did say ago? something about that, yeah. Yeah. You know, it's our time to repent to our Lord. Like Christ says, repent lest this come upon you as well. And that's what our call. When we read, we read Judges, close it and say, Father, forgive me <laughs> for I have sinned. Right. I mean, and that's, yeah, I, I did. I made the point, like, look, this this can be a time for us of repentance, and if we fail to use it that way, we've wasted it. We, we've not, mm-hmm. I mean, much much like I think the people of Israel, well, this is, again, throughout the book of Judges, you know, they they waste these opportunities for repentance, and, and they, they miss the point. I mean, so, so right now, I think we're missing the opportunity for repentance in the way mm-hmm. that we get angry at our leaders for not doing whatever it is that we think they should be doing. And and right. not, not not to say that leaders don't have a responsibility. We're not denying that. But but come on Christians, let's let's repent. That's that's mm-hmm. the proper use of this time. And I mean that's what the people here fail to do as well. They fail to repent. They they're not looking at Gideon and his missteps and s- seeing Gosh, where where is the sin within me that would lead me that same way? They're just they're following right after him into right. these sins, and and they're not you know they're not recognizing his his godly qualities either in the way that he faithfully did good for the people of Israel that the Lord did this. They're missing this opportunity for repentance, and I, yeah, I mean I just, this this whole time <laughs> of a pandemic, as as you know, Pastor Hall has just been very challenging to navigate. Personally, yeah. pastorally, in in all sorts of respects, but I, I wonder how often I've missed that opportunity to repent, and instead I've been angry at my my neighbor. I've been mm-hmm. surprised. I've I've panicked as as if I didn't know my own sinful condition, and and the, I I think I think we could use, and this is always true, pandemic or not. We can all use a healthy dose of repentance, and and if the Book of Judges won't give it to us, I'm not sure what text will. Well, and the thing is, only Lutherans can preach this way because we properly understand what repentance is. Repentance isn't just, I feel bad and I'm sorry about it. Repentance is true contrition, guilt because I have wronged God and sinned against my neighbor, and faith that God forgives me. That I repent not to a wrathful deity that I have to appease with my good works or my progress, but rather the God who is merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, who desires not the death of the sinner, but that all may live and be forgiven. That is the God that to whom I repent, to whom I cling and say, Father, forgive me. The God who died on the cross for me is the God who absolves me. So when I repent, I'm running to a God who wants nothing more than for me to dwell in the eternal dwellings. Mm. That's to whom we repent. So every one of these situations is to wake us up to that. Um, I said it to someone the other day in this time of COVID. They were upset that they couldn't go into uh, that uh, a mom and pop store closed. And I said, well, that's terrible. I said, well, did you go give them business? They're like, no. I, and then I'm like, well, then be quiet. All you're doing is complaining. You're belly aching. Look at all the blessings God has given you. Look at what has come upon you. Repent and believe and dwell in holy absolution. Mm. Um, That was Luther's first thesis, right? The entire Christian life is one of repentance. Mm. It's a beautiful life when understood as (laughs) in a biblical sense. Right, repentance and forgiveness, that the that dual nature of it. That as you said, that's what we have as Lutherans and that's what we hold on to. And that is that is the key. The, the way we speak it liturgically and in, in the divine service. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us. And I mean that right. that's that's the wonder of it, is that when we when we go to the Lord in repentance and confession, we don't find there an angry God. We find there a merciful God because of Christ Jesus. And and that's that's the beauty of it. And that's I mean that that's what the people of Israel are are missing when they fall into their idolatry. And and I I've had this conversation, I think, with some other guests as well, that you know, we we often look at idolatry and, and think that's that's quaint, that's cute, or it's, we don't we don't fully appreciate just how bad it is. But it's two different religions. I mean, the religion we're right. talking about in, in terms of confession and repentance, we find a merciful God there. 
But these idolatrous right. religions, you don't find a merciful God, you find a cruel God, one who demands and who's who's ready to, to destroy you if you make one misstep. I mean, that right. that's totally different. And, and that's why it's such a big deal. And I, I think we miss that so often when it comes to the matter of, of holding on to true doctrine, to the, to the right teaching of God's Word. If we don't have that, we'll, we'll miss that, and we'll fall into this religion where all that we have is an angry, cruel God who hates us, when, when we've got, in Christ Jesus, a God who loves us and forgives us and is gracious and merciful. And, and that's, I mean, oh, if we miss that, we, we lose everything. Oh, well, and that's all that matters. That's the that's the beauty. I, Luther makes that point in the third article of the Creed and the Large Catechism. Toward forgiveness is directed everything that is done in the church. That is what it's all about. It's not about anything else. It's all about you being forgiven. Mm-hmm. Everything is directed toward that. And when you miss that, then you have to carry around your God because he's made of wood, gold, and silver mm-hmm. instead of flesh and blood that died for you on the cross. So, Pastor Hall, we've got about three minutes here left on the morning. We've we've looked. I mean, we've we've touched on various aspects of this text. As you as you look at the end of Gideon's life here, as we get in Judges chapter eight, and we reflect on everything we've talked about today, summarize this, bring it home, and and make sure that we we preach Christ from this text today. <laughs> There's a Foot Locker commercial out right now with Charles Barkley, James Harden, and Scottie Pippen, where they talk about not having memory. They forget. The best NBA players forget everything. That's when Scottie Pippen says, I was, I'm, I'm the greatest Chicago Bull of all time. <laughs> and it's like, ah, oh, it's hilarious because it's not obviously him. Um, we all have a memory problem. And you see that with Israel. She keeps... He, she, he keeps, he keeps forgetting how merciful God is, how loving God is, how good God is. And we do this every week. We forget how good God is toward us in Christ Jesus. We, we hear it on Sunday and then we, it's like 51st dates. We have amnesia. Once we go to bed, we wake up and forget about it. The reason your pastor wants you in church, the reason he wants you there is not so he can beef the numbers up and be have the greatest attendance. He wants you there to remind you again how good God is for you, how he forgives you and loves you and will never leave you nor forsake you. If we can all confess this memory problem, this memory loss, then it casts us into the word even more because we then see how good and gracious our Lord is toward us. We are just like the Israelites. We forget all the good things Gideon did. We forget all the good things Jesus did for us. But that's why the church is here, to remind you anew every day that your God is the God who loves you, forgives you, and claims you as his own forever. Pastor Chris Hull serves at Zion Lutheran Church in Tomball, Texas, helping us this morning with Judges chapter 8, verses 22 through 35. Pastor Hull, thanks for being our guest as always. Thank you for having me. It was a fun time, as always. We've got a memory problem. We forget what the Lord has done for us, like Gideon, like the people of Israel, and yet the Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, showing his grace to us even in our sin, that grace that has been made complete in his Son, Jesus Christ, crucified, risen, and ascended for you and for me. I am your host here on Sharper Iron, Pastor Timothy Apple of Grace Lutheran Church in Smithville, Texas. Thanks for spending the morning with us. Talk to you again tomorrow.